This is the first lecture in our series on engineering design, and I'd like to introduce the topic of engineering design with a comparison about what most students learn in college, which I would call engineering science, versus what people have learned about engineering design. And a lot of this work comes from an excellent book called Designing Engineers by Louis Bucciarelli, and there's an also an excellent book called Designerly Ways of Knowing by Nigel Cross. And the second book particularly talks about uh, what's known about design and the epistemology or, or ways of thinking of engineering design. So let's do a couple comparisons between engineering science and engineering design. So we've got a good idea of how a design class may differ significantly than the engineering science classes many students are used to. Uh, first of all, in engineering science, we have well-defined problems. Um, there's a solution to the problems. You always expect there to be a solution when you're given the problem. There's an optimal approach. Uh, there are better and worse ways of doing the problem, even though uh, some ways, although slower, more lengthy, or more difficult, can get you to the right answer. And you're really focusing on a strategy to solve the problems. Um, and the problems don't change once you start solving them. When you're solving for those forces or for that voltage or current, uh, the problem is changing while you're solving it. Engineering design, on the other hand, tends to deal with what are called ill-defined or often wicked problems. Um, and these are characterized by it's never really clear exactly what the problem is. Uh, it's hard to say exactly what the problem is. Um, the problem, the constraints, and the solution tend to evolve together. In other words, if you come up with a solution, um, the problem may look completely different and a new solution may be necessary. <clears throat> and um, as a result of all of this, the problem changes as the designer understands more. The more you learn about the problem, the more you see it in a new light, and the more that the problem itself and the solutions change. Engineering science problems also tend to be convergent. Um, as you work on the problem, you tend to converge toward a solution. When you get a solution, you're done. It marks the end of the effort. And you're really focusing on understanding the solution path. How did you get uh, from point A to point B? So the next time you encounter a problem like this, uh, you simply plug and chug and can solve it. Engineering design problems can be both convergent and divergent. Um, as you work a problem, you may converge toward a solution, or you may have a new realization that causes you to have this divergent leap and diverge away from a previous solution when you realize it won't work or it doesn't fit the constraints. Any solution, no matter what solution, helps you redefine the problem. So converging on solutions quickly, then reworking, revising, improving these solutions tends to be a focus of design work, unlike engineering science work, where you're really trying to solve a fairly narrow problem and do it correctly. Um, engineering science focuses on analysis. The path to a solution is found by analyzing the problem. We really hone your analysis skills in engineering science courses. In engineering design, what's really more important than spending a lot of time analyzing problems is iterating. The final the path to a final solution is through intermediate solutions. So generating solutions quickly, trying them on for size, and learning more about the problem you're actually solving is the way to success. In engineering science, we tend to try to define the problem. We match a, pollution, uh, a solution process to a problem type. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, problems of type A are solved this particular way. Um, and once a path is discovered, and the great thing about engineering science problems is once you know how to do a particular type of problems, if you can fit any type of problem to that particular class, you know how to solve it. So it's very, very efficient for problems that are solvable. In engineering design, on the other hand, rather than defining problems, we tend to scope the problem. Uh, we have to figure out what the problem I'm really solving is, and we have to explore the possible solution space, because often the solution space extends to areas that don't even seem related when you first start to look at the problem. The other nice thing about engineering design is that the problem space can be changed. By redefining the problem, by learning more, you may realize the problem space is bigger or shaped differently than you originally thought, and something that didn't seem like a solution may be a very cost-effective and fast solution to the problem if you simply change what the problem is. So let's take a look at an example, because I've used a lot of words up to this point. And let's see how an engineering science problem would look at this uh, very simple picture of a block and tackle, which I'm sure you've all seen before. And let's see how we'd look at this in engineering design. And so 
it's really not necessary when I put arrows on the figure like this to explain what these arrows represent. They represent forces, it's a block and tackle, we can calculate things, and some of the questions we might ask about this problem, um, either explicitly on, on the paper in our homework assignments or in our head, may look something like this. What are the forces? Well, these are things we can calculate. Is there friction? Because friction may be another force we need to account for in solving the problem. Can we assume one gravity of acceleration? Um, if we're on Earth, we can. Maybe this is done in a spaceship and the problem is completely different. Um, how many times does a rope go through the block and tackle? Because as you know, if we have longer uh, area lengths of rope, the amount of force the hand needs to pull is completely different. And of course, what formula do I use? Because when you're given a lot of these types of problems and you want to go do something fun, uh, unless you really like this type of problem, you want to plug the numbers into the formula and get the answer as quickly as, as possible. And so, so this last question is perhaps the most important for people who are busy or in a hurry or where their time costs money. An engineering designer, on the other hand, would not look at forces and would not say, oh, we're going to put these arrows on, but instead we're going to scope the problem space. We're going to ask a lot of questions. And the questions an engineering designer asks may look completely different. What's the most weight we'll ever need to lift? You don't care about this because you're given the weight in the, in the engineering science problem. This is really critical if you're designing. Uh, what are the pulleys rated for? If I use pulleys that have too low of a rating for the force or the weight, um, the whole thing can come crashing down and then I've got a lawsuit. Uh, can the beam hold that much weight? Similar types of problem. How much does the rope cost per meter? Uh, because certainly I can lift more weight if I have more rope and higher rated pulleys, but this may not stay within the cost constraints of the problem. And is A, the hand over here, wearing gloves? That's a legitimate question because this is a safety concern. And in engineering science, you don't really care about safety, but in engineering design, this is one of the constraints we're required by law and by ethics to follow. So let's quickly review engineering science versus engineering design. In engineering science, a key skill is classification, i.e. what type of problem is it, and the language we use is mathematics. In engineering design, the key skills focus on process. How do I iteratively move through the problem space using a process that is most efficient? And the language we use is sketches, imaging, models, um, things very different than the analytical mathematics you're often taught in the engineering science domain. If we look at an even broader perspective, at the big picture, and think about three classes of human knowledge, the sciences, the humanities, and design, what's studied in the sciences is the natural world. In humanities, we study the human world. And in design, we can say this is the study of the artificial world. The methods used by scientists are experiment, classification, analysis, very rational skills. In the humanities, we use analogy, metaphor, and evaluation, uh, skills that many engineers and scientists are uncomfortable with but are very, very good for studying the human world. The methodology we use in design is modeling, pattern formation, and synthesis, creating new solutions out of old solutions. And each of these various fields of study has their own values as well. Scientists value objectivity, rationality, and they're engaged in a search for truth. The humanities is much more subjective, and you have much more opportunity to use your imagination, and they're concerned with justice and the human condition. Uh, design, what we're going to be studying in this class and what we're talking about in this talk, the values are practicality, ingenuity, and a search for appropriateness. Does the solution I come up with fit the problem? Is it appropriate for what the customer wanted? Hopefully this gives you a good introduction to the differences between engineering science and engineering design, and we'll continue the series of design lectures later on looking at the design process.